All right, hi everybody. It is four o'clock and we're gonna go ahead and get started. I see a lot of people are still chiming in here. We The attendees list is growing and it looks like we've got folks from, oh my gosh, Connecticut and Rhode Island and Michigan and lots of Mainers and it's really, this is very exciting, very fun. Um, my name is Chrissy Allen. I'm the development director at Blue Hill Heritage Trust. And I'm really excited to be here on behalf of Lander Nesbitt, who's usually running this show uh, today. And uh, this is the Friends in the Field series that Blue Hill Heritage Trust and Island Heritage Trust have been collaborating on since this spring. This, I believe, is our 20th webinar, which is incredible. They've been going really well. And if you've missed some or several, uh, you can go and find them on at least Blue Hill Heritage Trust's website, maybe also through Island Heritage Trust, and it's really fun to go back and watch the videos of the presentations that have been going on here. Um, Blue Hill Heritage Trust is a land conservation organization serving the mainland of the Blue Hill Peninsula, and Island Heritage Trust is across the bridge serving Deer Isle Stonington. And joining me today is Julia Zell, who is the new executive director of Island Heritage Trust. So congratulations, Julia. That was just announced this weekend, super exciting. And I'm so thrilled to have her here with me today. Um, I just wanna to mention to everybody, this is being recorded. And again, you'll be able to find this video on the Trust website in a couple of days. Uh, we have an educational resources page with all the webinars on it. And of course, we just really want to say thanks to our donors and supporters who make free programming like this possible. Um, both, both Blue Hill and Island Heritage Trust have an amazing core uh, supporter base. And if you are enjoying our trails or our programming, we hope that you'll consider supporting us. Uh, you can go to either of our websites to find out more about how to do that. I'm gonna pass it over to Julia here for just a second to do some technology housekeeping, and then I'll introduce Zoe and we'll get, we'll get rolling. Thank you, Chrissy. So as Chrissy mentioned, I'm Julia and uh, just recently became the new executive director of IHT, Island Heritage Trust. And I'm sitting in for Jake today. If you've visited in the past or watch any of the recordings, you'll, you'll see Jake who's wonderful. And he's, uh, enjoying a much deserved vacation. So he'll be back next week. Or, But in the meantime, I'm here with Chrissy and Zoe, and I'm so excited. And I would ask that, so everybody's muted. This is sort of, if you've done a webinar before, this is sort of typical format. And we'll ask that if you have a question, go ahead and type it in the chat box. And then we are gonna take 10 or 15 minutes at the end to sort of go through questions with Zoe. And if you want to ask a question live, you can raise your hand, which you'll find at the bottom of your page, and uh, you'll be able to raise your hand and we can unmute you so that you can ask your question live. But go ahead and ask questions all along. We'll, we'll keep track of them and uh, Chrissy and I will make sure we, we get to them at the end. So without further ado, thank you so much. Excited to be here. Excellent. Thank you so much. So I'm really thrilled to, um, to be able to present Zoe Weil here. She's the co-founder and president of the Institute for Humane Education in my hometown of Surrey, Maine. And uh, outside of her, her really awesome and important job there, sort of sticking up for animal protection and environmental sustainability and human rights, Zoe also loves to explore and do amazing outdoor nature photography. And she really has, uh, she's discovered some incredible things about our natural landscape. And we're just so thrilled to have her here and have her share her gorgeous images and little discoveries with us and hopefully inspire all of us to go outside this week and this weekend and find our own amazing discoveries. So, so I'm gonna pass it off to you and thank you so much for being here today. Oh, well, thank you so much for inviting me. So I wanted to start by saying that when I was a child growing up in the 1960s and 70s and watching National Geographic specials on TV, like many other people, many other children, I wanted to grow up to be like Jane Goodall and work with animals. 
And uh, when I graduated from college, I did get to work with animals. I was a teacher and naturalist at a wildlife rehabilitation and nature center, and I loved it. But I started to come to the conclusion that it was more important that I work for animals as well as for social justice and environmental preservation than that I work with them. And that led to my lifelong career as a humane educator teaching about the interconnected issues of human rights and environmental sustainability and animal protection in order to create a world where all people, animals, and nature can thrive. But I have remained passionate about animals and nature. And so I was thrilled that I had the opportunity when I was a student in the Maine Master Naturalist program last year to produce a capstone. And I decided to combine my love of nature and my experience as an educator to produce this presentation. And so I am going to turn off my video um, and then I will begin the presentation. And when it's over, I'll turn the video back on for the Q&A. My goal in this presentation is to awaken your awe and curiosity and deepen your love for Maine's wonders. I also have an ulterior motive, that through that awe and love, you will find yourself ever more motivated to protect and care for other species and nature. This presentation is divided into four sections, sex and reproduction, metamorphosis and transformation, iconic main beauty and the weird and wild. Now, of course, it makes sense to start with sex and reproduction since that's how life begins and maybe also to capture your attention right away. And so we begin on a rainy evening in early April when the spotted salamanders emerge from their long winter under leaf litter and logs in the woods and migrate to vernal pools and ponds to congregate. There, they roll and twist and dance together over several nights with the males depositing their spermatophores, the females picking them up to fertilize and then lay their eggs, and then both sexes disappearing within a week or two to return to their solitary lives in the woods. The wood frogs also arrive in April and quack like a cross between a duck and what I imagine a gnome sounds like, while the tiny spring peepers soon follow with their deafening peeps. I find it ironic that this female peeper on the right seems to be requesting some quiet as evidenced by her use of the shush sign despite the cacophony the males must make to arouse the female's interest, as evidenced by the following video. Papers seem to go to great lengths to achieve their goals, including tolerating the thorns of rugosa roses and sometimes confusing their own species with the aforementioned spotted salamanders. Next come the gray tree frogs who trill rather than peep and sound uncannily like the creatures on the Star Trek original series episode Galileo 7, at least to me. And as I play this video, you'll hear peepers and tree frogs trilling in the background before you hear the one in front of you trilling. It's not just amphibians who are mating, of course. There's a lot of love happening in spring. And if you're into watching others mate, just go outside in April, May, and June and look for some invertebrates. You will find them mating in a variety of positions, some typical and some Im demonstrating impressive gymnastics move, and some, like water striders, mating while standing on water. Flowers don't mate, of course, but they do reproduce through pollination, and how lovely that some invertebrates are so cooperative, often mating and pollinating at the very same time. 
In the case of bees, they bring pollen back to their nests as this honeybee plans to do. With many bumblebees, they carry pollen in their pollen baskets that are those bright orange little uh, circles that you see along their legs. And these are called corbicula, which I think is a fantastic word. Now the results of that bee pollination are fields of lupin. Lupin may not be native, but boy are they gorgeous. One of the curious things about them is how they move throughout the day. Mostly the flowers are upright like steeples, but periodically they go a little haywire. Not to worry, however, they'll likely be standing tall in the morning. When their days are done and they've gone to seed, first as fuzzy green pods and then as dry brown pods, make sure to stand quite still on a hot day in late July or early August in a lupin field and just listen. You're likely to hear the pods pop, pop, popping all around you, dispersing their little brown seeds so that next year we'll have more lupins. One of the more amazing things you'll find if you look very closely at lupins are the bajillion aphids who chew up lupin stalks over the course of a week or two. Bajillion may not be an actual number, but you get the idea. Weeks will go by with nary an aphid in a lupin field and then suddenly they're coating the stems. How does this happen so quickly? Well, aphid reproduction is nothing short of astonishing. Not only are aphids viv viviparous, meaning they bear live young like we do, although they also lay eggs like other insects, which we don't do, but they also give birth to pregnant clones of themselves. Yes, you heard that right. You are looking at aphids who are popping out pregnant clones every 30 minutes. Now, not every plant needs an insect for pollination. Our beautiful grasses can do the job of reproduction with just a gust of wind. Spruce trees sometimes get a little help from large mammals passing by. And in this case, the large mammal is my husband, Edwin Barkdahl. Some slime mold spores like this chocolate tube steminitis also spread through wind, but sometimes they too get a little help from their friends. After all that sex, egg laying and birthing, it's time to turn into a larva or nymph and then metamorphose into an adult. Having never been a larva or nymph myself, I can only imagine how wild it would be to go through an entirely other phase of existence. In the following slides, you'll see spotted salamander eggs growing from what I call their eyeball stage to what I call their nutlet stage to their development as tiny larvae with gills visible inside their eggs. And by the way, those little tadpoles swimming around the eggs on the left, those are larval wood frogs. And there is a close up of a spotted salamander larva about to emerge from the egg. In the case of gray tree frogs, I have never seen the eggs, but once they hatch into tadpoles, I usually see tons of them, although this year I hardly saw any. My only theory is that we had a snapping turtle living in our pond and perhaps the snapper ate them all up. In a good tree frog year, however, hundreds of them slowly but surely grow legs, move to the bank of the pond, turn emerald green and lose their tail. Then one day, the baby gray tree frogs climb up the bank or on a reed and move out of the water and onto the land. There they often gravitate to the high bush blueberries by our pond, which gives you a good scale for assessing their size as well as their adorableness. And because I love these little baby frogs so much, I added two more pictures of them. And of course, before long, they'll be big, bumpy, funky looking adults ready to trill and start the whole process anew. 
Now, a presentation on metamorphosis wouldn't be complete without a discussion of monarch butterflies, so I'm going to devote some time to these creatures whose life and life cycle are a marvel. I'll start the description in late spring and early summer when the butterflies arrive, mate, and lay eggs. The eggs hatch into caterpillars who eat and eat and eat and grow and grow and grow, and in the process, shed their skin and grow some more, until they are ready to shed their skin a final time and pupate into a chrysalis. A couple of summers ago, I brought in some of these late August caterpillars, put them in an aquarium, and I made this sped up video of the pupation process. And my apologies in advance if the sound doesn't come through in this video as well as I would have hoped. As if this transformation weren't mind-boggling enough, what happens inside that chrysalis can take your breath away. Over the course of one to two weeks, the caterpillar dissolves into genetic goo and reforms into a butterfly. And just before it's time to emerge, you can see the folded up butterfly inside. And here's that process in a film made by my husband, Evan Barkdahl. <laughs> This is not the end, however. This butterfly, 
a male, as evidenced by the black spots on the lower part of the lower wings, now has to fly to Mexico, thousands of miles away, to a place he's never been, and his parents aren't accompanying him to show him the way. When he gets to Mexico, he'll rest up with hundreds of thousands of other butterflies, and come late winter, he'll mate, and eggs will be laid, and hatch into caterpillars who will eat and eat, and then metamorphose into butterflies who will fly north and then mate, and more eggs will be laid, and caterpillars will hatch and eat and eat, and metamorphose into butterflies who will fly further north. And eventually, on our butterflies will get to Maine, and our friend here's great great grandchildren will then make the journey back to Mexico at the end of the summer or early fall. And if that doesn't blow your mind, I don't know what will. Enough with the animals. It's not just they who transform. Maine's land forms as well. And there is little that is as breathtaking as the transformation of blueberry barrens into crimson fields in October, or the colors changing in the forests, or the transformation from the colorful terrain to the crystalline winter when our mountains, like our beloved tallest Mount Katahdin, is covered in snow and the lakes and bays freeze. Occasionally, something happens during an odd year, like a forest flooding and freezing, that one simply must take advantage of. When that happens, it's good to drop everything and go do something you'll remember for the rest of your life, like this. We are now done with metamorphosis and transformation, and it's time to just bask in Maine's beauty. Lots of states are beautiful, but Maine is extra special. Sure, there are states with more majestic mountains, bigger trees, and vastly more varied life forms. There are states with deserts, canyons, and semi-tropical climates. But because Maine has such varied habitats, including our huge coastline, we get a bit of everything. For example, we can regularly experience spectacular sunrises, sunsets, and storm cloud views over the ocean. And because we're mostly rural and getting into the wilderness is pretty easy, we can frequently see animals who live here. In spring and summer, we have lots of migrating songbirds visit and sometimes stay through the season some of whom offer quite the eye candy, like this scarlet tanager and these ruby-throated hummingbirds. And some of whom are just plain cool, sporting goggles or ray-bans, like the common yellow throat on the bottom left and the cedar waxwing on the right. We have lots of great blue herons who spend summers fishing in Maine, staring intently at the water before nabbing their prey, swallowing as if they're a person trying to get down a giant pill and then washing down their meal with a little salt water. If you venture through remote ponds and bogs, you may also find their rookeries where these prehistoric looking birds perch ungainly on giant nests. Of course, we have common loons, lots of loons, because as I just said, they're common, although that's actually just their name. You'll find them on lakes and in the ocean, and if you're lucky, you'll see them carrying their babies on their back, which is up there with the cutest thing you may ever see in your life, and it's on my bucket list to get a good photo of that. Oh wait, my bad. Barred owlets just might be the cutest thing you'll ever see in your life. That is, if you can stomach watching their parents decapitate and eviscerate squirrels, moles, voles, and sometimes even snakes to feed their hungry babies, as in the photo on the right. Winter in Maine is not the time to stay indoors and keep warm. It is time to go outside, especially in the snow, and look for animal tracks and snowshoe up mountains to look for snowy owls who fly down from the Arctic to winter in northern New England. The males, like the one on the left, are almost all white, and the females have black bars on their feathers, as you can see in the photo on the right. Despite appearances, I am very far away from these owls, using the super telephoto function on my camera. If you do decide to venture up mountains to view snowy owls, please keep your distance. If they fly away, that means you're too close. Maine also has plenty of seals, and seals are also adorable. 
Whether gray seals like the one on the top right and the big performer in the group on the bottom right, or harbor seals like the rest of these, seals have tons of personality. I'm frequently followed by them while paddle boarding, and they often stare into my eyes like a faithful dog, seemingly as interested in me as I am in them. Maine is also home to two very large rodents, beavers and porcupines. Now rodents get a bad rap, but I have to say that I love both beavers and porcupines. I was recently snorkeling in a remote stream where I took the photo in the center when a beaver swam right under me, not the beaver in the photo on the left, which Evan took not too far from the stream where we snorkeled. As for porcupines, they are frequent denizens of our woods, waddling along in their slow, deliberate fashion with little concern about predators because only one predator, other than people, has worked out how to kill such a well-protected animal. These are fishers. As the story goes, and I've never witnessed this myself, fishers run circles around porcupines who then turn in circles to protect themselves by keeping their backs pointed toward the fisher, quills raised. Apparently, fishers make porcupines so dizzy and tire them out so much that they eventually fall over, and then the fisher attacks their quillless bellies. Other than fishers and people, however, porcupines don't have much to worry about. And by the way, they do not throw their quills. They are completely harmless unless you or your dog tries to harm them. I would be remiss if I didn't include a photo each of Maine's two most iconic animals, moose and bald eagles both of whom can be spotted across the state. If you live in Maine and haven't seen these animals, it probably means you haven't been venturing outdoors enough. It's now time to wrap up our tour through Maine wonders with the weird and wild, starting with mushrooms. This one is a dog stinkhorn. I'll let you guess how it got its name, and yes, it's super stinky. You can smell these babies long before you see them, and that's saying something because, as you can see, they are not inconspicuous. Now, I'm a big fan of mushrooms. Not only have I become an avid mushroom forager, gathering and cooking them up in summer and fall and drying them for winter, I love all of them, edible, inedible, and poisonous alike, because they are fascinating life forms. I'm especially fond of the blue staining boletes, which turn indigo upon the slightest bruise and sometimes just by exposure to air if you cut them in half. Honestly, it's like magic. Maine offers some great opportunities for observing glow-in-the-dark life forms. Head to the shore at night when the moon is new and swish the water and you may see bioluminescent creatures who look like stars in the sea. Or head into the woods to find bioluminescent mushrooms. There's the common Pinellas stipticus that grows in profusion on dead trees or logs and glows green, as you can see in the photo on the left. And then there are the big orange jack-o'-lanterns near the base of oaks and on stumps that glow yellow, as you can see in the photos on the right. These photos were all taken by my husband who puts jack-o'-lantern fruiting times in his calendar so as not to miss the light show. Some mushrooms are quite inconspicuous and require getting down on your knees in order to find them, which is totally worth it. There are life forms that are quite otherworldly, even though they live right here on Earth. Lichens are among these. They are composite organisms that arise from algae or cyanobacteria and fungi, and they're everywhere, on tree bark and logs, on the ground, on rocks in the woods and at the shore, and even on furniture. And they come in so many colors and shapes and sizes. Find a patch of lichen, crouch down with a magnifying glass, and you'll feel like you entered a Dr. Seuss book. I sometimes wonder whether lichens actually were Dr. Seuss's inspiration. Since you will have gotten used to crouching, you might want to head to a tide pool and start crouching there, but please be careful. Life in these pools is fragile and you can cause quite a bit of harm stepping on animals you may not even realize are animals. All those barnacles at low tide, they are living beings. So do take care to step on bare rocks. And in the case you've never actually seen the living part of a barnacle, here's a video of one and that disc that you see, that opaque disc, that is a fish scale. 
At low tide, you're likely to see a lot of hermit crabs, like the one on the bottom right in this slide, who are territorial animals who occupy the shells of dead mollusks like periwinkles and often fight one another. Some of them have what appear to be orange, pink, or rust-colored shells, but if you look closely, you'll discover that their shells are actually covered in what's called snail fur, or Hydractinia echinata, a kind of colonial hydroid related to jellyfish. If you're lucky enough to find tubular hydroids, like the animals on the top right who look like pink flowers, you might also see a nudibranch, for whom hydroids are a food source. Nudibranchs, like the pellucid aeolus on the left, are a kind of a sea slug, but I prefer to just call them nudies. They're so tiny and so beautiful, you may feel like you stumbled into an undersea fairyland if you spot one. Other animals who look like underwater flowers are tunicates. The golden star tunicates on the left often cover rocks, shells, and seaweed, and the orange sheath tunicates on the right usually cover rocks. They're generally thought of as invasives in Maine, and I'll admit that there are times in late summer when they cover a lot and do seem to be taking over, but they are nonetheless extraordinary creatures. At low tide, you may spot something that looks like a blob of gooey who knows what, but look closely with your magnifying glass that has become your best friend by now, and you may discover that that goo is a dozen skeleton shrimp, as in this photo. And if you don't see them, here is a video of a skeleton shrimp on the move. Some shore creatures are best left alone. I'm told that these clam worms can inflict quite the bite, so if you see one of these beauties, best to admire from afar. It's common to find razor clam shells on the shore at low tide, but less common to ever see a living razor clam. This one, found by one of our dogs, who barked incessantly upon his discovery, booked it back home, as you will see in this video. My last video, which is coming up next, represents a labor of love. Among my favorite creatures in Maine are jellyfish. They are mesmerizing and weird as all get out with bizarre life cycles. I filmed these stunning animals, pun intended, over the years on my paddleboard with my waterproof camera, and I put together this final video that includes white cross and moon jellies, like the one on the right, various comb jellies, like the one on the left that aren't actually jellyfish at all, but are in the phylum Tenophora, and ends with the big stinging lion's mane like the one in the middle, whom I often see by the dozens in late spring by our home on Patton Pond, I'm sorry, Patton Bay, where I photographed this one.
I'd be remiss if I didn't end this presentation with a suggestion to look beyond our state and even our planet by gazing upward. We are lucky in Maine to have dark skies with little light pollution. Sometimes we are gifted with the wonder of a comet like Neowise that streaked through our night skies last month. These two photos were taken by Edwin and they remind me that we are part of a miraculous universe. The natural world beckons, so please do go outside. And if you found yourself falling in love with nature and other living beings through this presentation, I hope you will do all you can to protect them. And should you want to become a humane educator and teach others about the interconnected issues of environmental sustainability, animal protection, and human rights, be in touch. The Institute for Humane Education is here to help. Many thanks to the Maine Master Naturalist Program, my husband, Edwin Barkdahl, naturalists and nature writers, and scientists sharing new knowledge all the time. That was incredible. <laughs> I cannot believe that you got those video of those jellyfish in Patton Bay. I am so excited. Yeah. That was really neat. Uh, Oh my gosh, thank you so much. This this was such a beautiful treat and the, the chat box has been going nuts with people just so thrilled with the videos and just all of these amazing photos and information. We do have a couple of questions that came in and I hope people will feel free to jump on the chat box and throw more questions in there. Um, Holly wanted to know if uh, what you know about possums and if they're starting to migrate northward toward Tancock County. So first, I just want to correct something about the jellyfish. Not all those jellyfish were in Patton Bay. The only ones I see in Patton Bay are, are the lion's mane. Okay. So the ones were in the Bay of Fundy up by Lubeck, that area. Okay. So I know a lot about the uh, possums in Maine. I've heard that they're in southern Maine. I, um, I really don't know if they're on their way to Hancock County. But if I saw one, I'd be pretty excited. Excellent. And uh, someone had a technical question for you, which was wondering what kind of camera lens uh, you are using. And camera. Yes, thank you. Both for, both for stills and video. Two cameras, and both are point and shoots. So I have an Olympus Tuck, which is waterproof, and that's what I do all the macro photography with. And I have a Nikon Coolpix 900, P900, and that has this unbelievable zoom telephoto function. It goes out to 2000. So that's how I'm able to get those close-ups of the owls and the eagles and the seals and all of that. Cool. Julie, awesome. you wanna do some questions? There was a question um, right after you showed your skating in the, uh, in the birch trees, and I'm, I'm gonna mess it up saying it, but someone was asking if it was the Sir de Mont, or, or maybe you could tell us where it was. <laughs> uh, so it was Sir de Mont in, um, in Acadia, and um, there were a couple of people who uh, noticed that it had, it had flooded and frozen, and um, my husband actually told me about that, and um, the next morning um, there was gonna be a snowstorm, I have to get out there now. So I got up really early in the morning and I got out there and the snow was falling and I was actually skating through about two inches of snow through those birches. I mean, it was, it was surreal. At one point I, I was skating along the Jessup Trail and I just was going, 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 going. And then I, and I was videotaping with my phone and then I just tumbled over because it started to go uphill and the ice, you know, wasn't there anymore, but I didn't know because I was on the snow. Well, then the whole thing melted and it refroze. And so then it refroze like you saw. And, you know, it was really funny to watch, like being the only one out there, a couple people being out there to everybody in Maine came out. I mean, it was... <laughs> Yeah, it was quite the buzz all on social media, and yeah, it was really interesting. Yeah. Cool. 
So where are some of your, other than Maine, where are some of your other favorite locations to go and admire nature where you've been? Um, so um, probably my favorite thing to do outdoors is uh, scuba dive. And I don't get the opportunity very often and I don't scuba dive in Maine because I, 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 don't, I don't have the body fat to stay warm <laughs> in our water. Um, but um, scuba diving is just un- otherworldly to me. I mean, it is another world. It's the undersea world. And, um, and then I would say, other than that, my, my favorite place might be Utah. And um, that landscape is really incredible to me. But almost anywhere, you know, you can't go wrong with nature. So um, just getting out there, I, I find that, so I travel a lot for work or I did pre-COVID. Uh, travel a lot for work and um, anywhere I am for work, I find nature. I mean, even if it's literally um, plants growing through cracks in the sidewalk, I just look for nature wherever I am. That's right. Nature's everywhere. All right, let's see. Someone was asking about um, what do you know about koi wolves? Do we have coyotes or koi wolves here in Down East Maine? And I can say I've seen and heard many coyotes, even over here on the island. Yeah. Um, but I, you know, I'm sure you've had your own encounters. Yeah, I mean, there, there are coyotes all over here. Um, and sometimes people call them koi wolves. And I think they're just, not just, but I think they're coyotes. I don't think that they're actually, um, half wolf and half coyote. Um, I, I think that that just might be something we use as a term for coyote, but it's really coyote. Excellent. Any other questions from folks? I think we've gone through what was in the, what was in the chat box there. So I'd be curious to know, this is sort of a little more of a topical question. Uh, sharks have been in the news quite a bit. And I'm wondering with all the time that you spend, not that they would be in patent day, but if you personally have ever seen the larger sharks off the coast of Maine. I have not, no. And I, I mean, I, it was so tragic and awful what happened. Um, but I, I don't have any particular fear of sharks. Um, there are a lot of things to be afraid of and sharks, you know, really aren't one of those things that I, one of those things in nature I think we should be afraid of. Um, and they get a bad rap and I'll just put in a plug for if you um, feel inspired to protect sharks. Shark finning is a really awful um, activity that is practiced and, you know, shark's fins are cut off. They're only for the fins. They're thrown back in to the ocean to die slow, horrible deaths. So not great, you know, yeah, why do not great. Do so we can speak out about these things. That's, That's right. what we leaders do. That's right, and we're in their ocean. So don't dress up like a seal in a black wetsuit and <laughs> treat, treat their hood with respect, I guess. <laughs> said Christy. <laughs> We do have a question, another technical video uh, photo question. Someone was asking how you edit your photos and videos. Um, Not well. I don't have much proficiency with um, much in technology. That's why I point and shoot cameras, frankly. And um, so I, I use an old version of iMovie for some of that editing. and um, yeah, it, it's not it's not my skill set. I have to say, I do want to tell you um, that um, the reason why that jellyfish movie was such a labor of love is it's not easy to videotape jellyfish in the Bay of Fundy because the tides are so intense. So even if I'm at um, low tide or high tide, you know, when things are calm, the the tide moves so quickly that there are times when I'm trying to videotape them for, you know, just five, 10 seconds, 
and I discovered that my paddleboard is, you know, a hundred feet away from when I started. It's just that tide is moving me so quickly. And the water is so cold that I've been in the position where I'm holding my camera underwater and I can no longer depress the, um, the button because my hand is so frozen from, mm. you know, the cold of the water. So it, it took so much, so much footage, so much effort to get those little clips of those, um, of those jellyfish. Mm. So, so speaking of water temperatures, uh, John would like to know what evidence of global warming you personally have been noticing in sort of the natural landscape of Maine over the years. So, well, I can certainly tell you that I used to not be able to swim off the coast of Maine. And now in Patton Bay, where I would always have a wetsuit on, I can just go swim out there much of the time in the summer and be fine. So our the temperature in the Gulf of Maine has, um, has increased more than um, perhaps anywhere else on earth. I'm not sure of that, but certainly it's one of those places where it's increasing dramatically. Yeah. And what I don't know is how many things are caused by um, those warming temperatures and how many things are caused by cycles. But I can tell you that um, maybe 15 years ago, there was this massive die off of sea stars. And I found sea stars all over the shore in Patton Bay. And then I didn't see sea stars for a while. This summer, sea stars were everywhere. And um, when I was out at low tide, there were some rocks that were completely covered in them and they were eating the barnacles. And, you know, a week later, all the barnacles had been eaten and the sea stars had moved on. And um, I'm also noticing um, a lot of the pancake batter tunicates. Those are different than the tunicates that I showed you pictures of. Um, lots of them and just coating things. Um, and I don't know if that's climate change related or not. Um, there are a lot of fluctuations that um, seem to happen over the course of spring to fall. So I don't know the answer. Thank you. All right, more questions are rolling in. Let's see here. The Master Naturalist Program, is that nationwide or just in Maine? So the main master naturalist program is just in Maine. I've, I've heard that there are naturalist programs in different states um, that people have told me they've done, um, but it's really a fantastic program here in Maine and it's offered in different parts of Maine, different years. So um, for those who are interested, you'll learn a lot. Cool. I, I, I'm seeing a comment that I would love to address. Please. That, um, so Brandon um, writes, people are usually told to keep their distance from wildlife, but relationships can happen too, like in the lovely new movie, My Octopus Teacher, which is fantastic. I highly recommend it. It's on Netflix. Um, I, I was so glad that movie wasn't in a movie theater because I kept explaining out loud throughout the movie. <laughs> it's amazing. And I totally agree with Brandon. There are some animals you can get very close to and they don't seem to mind and um, we can have these incredible relationships with them. And then there are other animals where getting too close um, could impact them like the snowy owls. And um, so I always like to err on the side of caution. Um, however, as Brandon knows, because he and I have, have gone looking in tide pools together, I get about as close as you can get in a tide pool, trying to be really careful not to injure any animals. But oh my goodness, you know, getting up close with animals is amazing if you can do it without causing them harm. And what are some of your favorite animals to get be able to get up close and personal with? Um, oh, uh, the amphibians, for sure, because they never seem to mind me. And I'm, you know, it, I go out at night um, in in the spring and the peepers are peeping and the tree frogs are trilling and um, the um, night crawlers, the earthworms are out and they don't like you getting too close. They go right back in the earth if you get <laughs> to walk near them. Um, 
And I, I have to say that those nudie pranks, you know, I showed you that one pellucid aeolus that weren't, you know, the, the uh, sort of stalks coming out. Um, they're so incredibly adorable. They're tiny, they're this big. Um, mm. And just finding them, I just, it feels like, like finding a little jewel in the ocean. That's so fun. Obviously, jellyfish are my favorites. And if I'm willing to put my hand under a lion's mane, you know, with all those tentacles, I better love them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> True. Yeah, Jennifer comments that she has a rabbit who will listen to her talk while it sits on her lawn, nibbling away. It recognizes her voice. And I have a similar relationship with a porcupine at my house. And it's very <laughs> fun. <laughs> All right, Julia, did I miss any questions in there? There was, um, I think, could you say again the two types of cameras that you use? People asked about both of them. And, and so one particular was asking about the macro shots, which I think was the maybe the underwater one. But if you could just say those again that, that some people were asking. I can also type it in. That's an Olympus tuck. Um, and I'm just typing it in. Great. Others and Nikon Cool Pets 900, and I typed them both in. Great, thank you. I think that I think we covered pretty much everything. Excellent. Group, any final questions for the for the chat box or Julia? Do you have any? Oh gosh, I think. Um, well, I, when you were talking about the lion's mane, I was wondering if have you ever been stung? No. Wow. Lucky. <laughs> Honestly, I don't know why. Um, because, uh, you know, I have a habit of um, sort of losing myself in nature. Um, this has happened when I've been scuba diving. I mean, I will follow an animal, like, just forever. I mean, I, I once had... Um, people yelling uh, at me from a boat, like yelling, yelling, and I couldn't hear them until finally sort of I heard them because I, I just was following a, a dolphin who was um, swimming just ahead of me. Now that dolphin, you know, clearly was keeping the perfect distance for me to never get close, but was just taking me on a journey. And I also had that experience with a, a turtle. Oh, cool. Dope, dope. And I dove, 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 dove. And the dive master is like coming after me because I'm diving way too deep for my, like what I've been certified to dive. Like, and I, you know, putting my head in like right up close to a moray eel, like just dumb things. But I just lose myself. I become completely absorbed. And so it's funny because this is a, strange thing, but um, I've had a lot of nightmares about um, being attacked by wild animals, which is bizarre, given that I, I don't have any fear of any. I mean, except for deer ticks, they're probably the only thing I have a, a real fear of because I know what the consequences of, of Lyme are, but, but I, that could be the way I go one day. There's a wild animal because I, I should be a little bit more afraid. Sometimes. Do you know um, or have any personal recommendations for books for children who live near the sea to learn about creatures, like identification books or geared towards kids? Uh, you know, I, uh, so there are lots of story books. Um, I have a main North Atlantic, I, I can't remember the, the name of it. They're not enough. Frankly, I really want there to be more um, Gulf of Maine ID books uh, for the shore. Um, there's so many things I see and I, I don't really find enough information in the books that I have. So I'm, I'm sort of falling short on that, sorry. Barbara's suggesting that you write one. <laughs> <laughs> and Jean, everybody's <laughs> chiming in now. Go, Zoe, go. <laughs> 
Excellent. All right. Well, this has just been absolutely such a treat. And so I hope you've been able to see some of the chat box because people are just saying this was such a bright spot in their week and such a great science lesson. And I think we all need more of stuff like this these days. So we're very grateful to you for all of the work that you do, for taking time out to share all of this with us and inspire us. Um, it's just really terrific. And thank you everybody who joined us today. I hope you'll check out both websites for uh, all of these organizations represented here on the screen and consider lending your support if you're able. And uh, we're just, we're very grateful for everybody and hope everyone has a really terrific day. Julia, wanna say the last word? Thanks for sharing a little bit of wonder with us. You're so welcome. Thank you everybody for coming in. It was really, this is my first time doing this um, or doing a webinar like this ever. And um, it, I've been really looking forward to it. And for me, it's been enriching to just have a break from the world, for, for, from, from the peopled political world. And Excellent. <laughs> That's right. Always look to nature. <laughs> yep. All right, we're gonna sign off. Thanks everybody. This will be on the website here in the next day or two. Have a great evening. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Zoe. Thank you, Chrissy.